we're talking about a new topic here on safe cases that and we really don't need to motivate the, the need for this. Right? We're, we're, we're quite comfortable understanding this is an important issue. Um, how many of you have done cross terms where you've heard of significant safety problems, like people cutting off fingers, toes? Right? So this happens regularly. Anyone worked in a car term where there's someone been killed at the site while he's been there? Not, not too surprising, and we'll see why that, why that statistic is valid in a minute. Um, but we recognize that as chemical engineers, we're dealing with systems where we're containing material that has the potential to react in catastrophic ways sometimes. Usually it's, uh, it's, it's an unintended reaction. It's a, it's a side effect of the material we're dealing with can work in a way that's unintended. Or we're dealing with systems where we're containing flammable liquids. Or we're dealing with systems where we're containing high temperature, high pressure material. Okay? And if that vessel fails, it leads to rupture and explosion. So we, we have these units and we have materials that we work with that are intrinsically unsafe in the sense that they contain energy that could be released. Okay. Our goal in this section is to understand how we can work with those systems in a safe manner. So we're going to look at the next next uh, class, not in today's class, but in the next class, we're going to look at a hierarchy of systems that we put in place to prevent these uh, unsafe situations from occurring. Today's class, we're going to look at some historical unsafe situations and learn what went wrong so that we can then see why we look at these hierarchy uh, in tomorrow's, in, on Friday's class. So today's section is really the motivation for the work we're going to look at for the next uh, four or five classes. Now, we'll start by looking at the safety record of the industry, uh, and then today, and some, some accidents. Next class, we'll look at this hierarchy, as I said, we'll then look at pr pressure relief, because that's often one of the major sources of accidents are due to contain pressure. <coughs> And then we already looked at the DP Texas City accident on Monday. From this DP Texas City accident, as well as several other accidents, we've, we we learned from that, and we we will perform in the future. You'll see at your site we perform hazard operability studies. These are studies where we sit down and, and try to understand what might potentially occur, and we put systems in place to prevent problems from happening. So these accidents we're going to consider today, as well as your own company's history of internal accidents are what are used to inform and form these hazard and operability studies. Okay, so that was, this is the key mechanism, this hazard study. It's a key mechanism that we, we implement as engineers to make our processes more safe, or, or, or what I call intrinsically safe. Okay, so I want you to think of this idea when you think of intrinsic safety. How many of you bought and assembled a piece of IKEA furniture? Okay, how easy is it to screw up the instructions? I'm being, like seriously, like so it, it, may, it may take you a second try, but can you ever assemble it so that you put those bolts in the wrong way? No. Look at it carefully next time. You'll see there's asymmetry always in their designs. You cannot assemble those units with the shelf the wrong way around because the pin and holes are always offset asymmetrically. So if you, if you do it, you're doing it intentionally incorrectly, or not paying attention, okay? So that's a design that's intrinsically safer, if you want to see it that way. <coughs> we can design our processes so that we can, that they're tolerant to human faults and tolerant to human mistakes, okay? So you'll never prevent the person who's not thinking at all from going ahead and making a mistake. But can we create a system so that it's more safe in, in the event that someone who's just got a momentary lapse of concentration or changing a valve position from closed to open, <coughs> altering something on the system, that, that small change doesn't cause a catastrophic chain of events to occur. Okay, so we're going to see that in all of these case studies today, there's never one thing that was the problem. It's always a multiple uh, occurrence of, of things that occur. Uh, an occurrence of multiple events that, that lead to that accident. So when we look at these accidents, we use some statistics to judge their severity. And the first one here is the fatal accident rate, FAR. So 
count of the number of people that die, not get injured, you're not concerned with injuries, people that, that lose their life, take a thousand people working in an environment, after their full lifetime of working in that environment, of those thousand people you started with, a certain number of them will die due to accidents in the workplace. What is that number? So that's one way to judge the fatality, the fat fatal accident rate. The fatality rate then is if we take that far value, so let's say six people die in a particular type of work environment, multiplied by the hours work divided by that large number 10 to the 8, that gives the number of fatalities per year. So the fatality rate, and that should be low. Like we want a really low fatality rate. And we want to see that decreasing over the years. OSHA has another rate, the incidence. This is the number of illnesses and injuries in 100 work years. So this is what's used in the United States. So this thing like uh, cutting yourself um, on a piece of equipment or losing a limb um, and, and so forth. So injuries and illnesses. So this is what's used in the UK system. In the US, the incident rate is not the most. So let's take a look at some FAR values for various sectors. So the chemical industry has a FAR value of four. So a thousand people working in the, in the environment, of those four over their whole lifetime will die. Steel industry, that number is eight. Coal, 40. Asbestos up here, very high. Pretty much 62% of everyone working in the industry is going to die. Okay, so that's why we've shut down asbestos mines, except in Quebec, well, just up to years. So, so that's a pretty good rate over there, four for the chemical industry. Okay, we've, done, we've done a reasonable amount of work over the past years to get that number down. Now, this number will change depending on the sample of data you use. It's a statistical analysis based on a, a particular snapshot in time and on a location, so a geographic location. So if you look at another study, these numbers will, uh, will adjust slightly, but uh, probably rank in that similar order. Now what we look for is, if you stayed at home, three out of a thousand. Okay, so what we typically would like is we would like our workplaces to be about as safe as you are at home. That's a re reasonable uh, kind of ideal to strive for, right? In fact, you'd likely and should want your industry where you work in to be more safe than staying at home. Okay, so this is sort of like a, a bound that we can strive for and hopefully exceed. If you're traveling by car to work, you're, you're far more unsafe in that moment of time that you're traveling to work than you actually are at work. Okay, so that's, that's an interesting um, Cigarette smoking. The far for that is 40. Okay, so you're 10 times more likely to die from cigarette smoking than from working at work. As Dr. Martin said, that's your first safety tip, is don't smoke. Okay, so that's a, those numbers give us some relative ranking. Now let's take a look back at the um, that other metric we, we asked about earlier, or spoke about earlier, the fatality rate. So this is the the rate at which uh, people are, are dying due to um, in the workplace. So if we take the chemical industry, four people are dying, and according to the FAR, multiplied by that uh, number of hours worked, divided by 10 to the 8, we get a very small number of fatalities per year. So it's a, it's a, it's a safe-ish industry, but the problem is this is considering the people working in the facility. We, don't have these units in isolation. So our neighbors around us are going to be impacted by our chemical plants. So we saw that in the BP Texas City case study, 18 people died, 15 of those, uh, sorry, I think it was 15 people died. Those were all in the trailer next to it. Those were actually outside consultants. That's why they were in this temporary trailer. Okay, so that part of the BP accidents high fatality rate was the inappropriate situation of that trailer. It should not have been placed so close to those plants. Um, and in fact, was in violation of the guidance given by the American Petroleum Institute. So those 15 deaths were, were arguably preventable. Interestingly enough, those deaths would not get counted here in some of these incident rates because it's kind of 
the perverse fact is that those people were not employed directly by the company, so they don't count as employees, so their deaths don't show up on your statistics. Okay? So you'll see this regularly. When the moment you put one of these up and you define it, people find a way to work around it. So the incident rate, companies want to keep the incidence rate low because they have to report that to OSHA. So one way they can keep the incident rate low is hire outside people to do the work that's, that's more unsafe. Because if an accident happens, it doesn't show up on their record. Another way that that can work is, let's say one of the employees does get injured at the site. Uh, one of the other statistics is that as long as that employee is able to show up at work the next day, it doesn't count. And so what they'll often do is, even though your arm is in a sling because you've broken it, you still have to show up at work. You don't have to do anything, you just have to sit there at your desk. But you're showing up at work, it's not a lost day. So companies find all sorts of ways to work around these statistics. The moment you put up a metric, there's ways to work around it, and, uh, and people will do that. So that's just a, a bit of background there. So as, as said here, we, we don't have, when we look at those numbers, the FAR and so forth, also we should consider our outside contractors that are working at our site and the people around us. We don't want to be injuring and killing them either. Okay, so they're not just we're not just focused on ourselves in internal into the company. We should also consider our, our neighbors around us. Now another way that people also judge these statistics is to look at voluntary activities versus involuntary activities. So we'll see here how people will often accept higher risk for voluntary activities, so rock climbing or skydiving. So these are things that you do out of your own, own choice and you <coughs> may accept higher risk for that. So that's, uh, that's important to distinguish that. Uh, going to work <laughs> is not considered a voluntary activity, it's something that you have to be at. So, so we, we, we want lower risk at work. If we're putting ourselves in harm's way, we, we, we have to accept that risk ourselves. Another interesting thing about those fatality rates to bear in mind is that the fatalities are a product of how often they occur multiplied by the number of deaths per, per accident. So you can have a situation where if there's an accident, you kill one person, and that has, a, has, a, has that frequency. And you can have another accident where you kill a, a whole bunch of people far, far more people, but that probability of that accident occurring is very low, and you get the same fatality rate. So, so there's again, the moment you put up a number like this of, uh, of these statistics, people will find ways of altering and working around it. We ideally want our, our incidents to both have low fatalities per accident. Should an accident occur, we want to minimize that reduce that probability of killing people, and we want to reduce the frequency with which that accident occurs. Okay, so when we talk about this fatalities per accident, we want to minimize that. Think about it in this way. One of the accidents we're going to look at in Bhopal released methyl isocyanate. It's an intermediate chemical when producing a pesticide. This company chose a particular flow sheet and a reaction sequence that created this intermediate product. Their competitors chose a flow sheet that worked around that intermediate. So that intermediate never had to be created and stored. So there was an alternative technology to create the same pesticide as your final product without going and creating this very toxic intermediate. The alternative technology costs more money. <coughs> So which design do you pick? Well, you've got this inherently unsafe chemical in the middle. It's a cheaper design. Or you go with a more expensive flow sheet that eliminates this toxic intermediate. Okay, so in hindsight, the answer is easy to, to, to come up with. You don't go the root of this toxic intermediate. But this is what I mean when we think about the fatalities per accident. If we can come up with a way to minimize the number of people we could kill, in an accident by choosing alternative flow sheets, alternative technologies, then we should strive for that. Okay, so 
standard quote we need to learn from history, but we don't. So here's uh, the Hindenburg that uh, crashed um, in New Jersey just after the uh, during the World War of 1943. So a hydrogen explosion. Then we did the same thing again for Challenger Space Shuttle. So a large explosion there due to fuel leaks. And this one was interesting because on this particular accident, the engineers had done a very thorough analysis and proved that the O-rings that would seal the propellant uh, would become brittle under the temperature conditions that it would be exposed to. And that O-ring would fail and lead to this disaster. The simple O-ring is a piece of rubber plastic, right? Um, and it was dismissed as being uh, irrelevant and actually did end up causing the issue. Okay, so a few minutes after the takeoff, that is the Challenger space shuttle exploded. Okay, so there's, there's, a, there's an interesting backstory there. I, I encourage you to read up a bit about it because there it's very much engineers versus management. There's a lot there related to how engineers presented their results. The results were not clearly communicated to management. And that you, so you can argue both ends. The engineers stated their case, but they did it in a way that didn't communicate it. Let's take a look at one of the first industrial accidents that spurred a change in the industry. Okay, so up prior to this point in the 1970s, accidents were occurring frequently, but this is one which really started a change in the chemical industry and is really where a lot of the practice we follow to this day comes that was initiated from. And the fact that it's in the United Kingdom also points out why a lot of the safety material we use is a British based. So Flixborough is a site where they're producing a, a chemical and there's several reactors in series. So six reactors in series and a leak developed between the reactor four and five. And sorry, a, a problem developed, I should say, in reactor five. So to eliminate that reactor, they bypassed it by going from four to six. So this is your standard CSTRs in series problem see in, in reactor design. Okay? So now these are not small reactors. These are them over there. That's one reactor. Okay, so there's your, your six reactors in series. Here's one lying on the ground. There's those pipes connecting them. So those pipes are about 20 inch in diameter. It's big, big connections. So the, that uh, reactor five is out of commission because of the, the damage to it. And we can still run the process by running with five reactors instead of six. So each reactor is incrementing a conversion, but it can still operate fairly well with five rather than six. So it seems simple on paper. Let's connect four to six by just using this sort of piping situation over here. Now the issue is that these reactors are agitated and they're vibrating when they're moving. So these connections between the reactors are not rigid pipes. They've got sort of this accordion type connector over there. Now what ended up occurring is that the person designed that pipe connection was not qualified to do the work. And down here, this pipe, the bypass stream ruptured, so that connection ruptured, resulted in a large escape of cyclohexane. Cyclohexane formed a flammable mixture. So here's cyclohexane. It's not on the ground. It's not a liquid on the ground. It's vapor <coughs> in the air. So from the BPK study we saw on Monday, you've got an explosive mixture in the air. So you've got oxygen, you've got the source of fuel. This is going to explode and form a vapor cloud. And so liquid flammable material is fairly easy to deal with. It's on the ground, it's, it's got low contact area with the atmosphere. Vapor, far, far greater contact with oxygen and a continuous source of, of oxygen. So vapor explosions are always much, much, much larger and extensive than the liquid uh, explosion. So fatalities, 18 fatalities in the control room uh, because of the projectiles of the windows um, shattering. Fires burned for several days, and um, and that was it. But what this led to was the start of well, let's understand what happened. So firstly, we've got problem number one, and we'll if you 
taken, you've taken your full A course, right? So you, your engineering ethics course. Have any, you, is it next term or this term? Next term. Next term. Okay. So one of the first things you'll see in that ethics course is you should not do and you need to refuse work if you're not qualified to do. So I don't, I don't pretend to go design heat exchanges or mechanical, like the, the mechanical engineering aspect of the heat exchange. Like we can size them and propose that, but we don't do the mechanical design of them. Okay? We don't go build uh, bridges and buildings. Even though we have a basic understanding of stresses and strains, we don't go do the work of civil engineers. So, and, and it's, it's problematic in chemical engineering, right? Because chemical engineering, you notice, has so many branches that are very close to other engineering branches. So it's tempting sometimes to say, I think I know how to do this, or I'm kind of comfortable with this, okay? But recognize that some, something fairly simple as just connecting two pipes together without a proper mechanical analysis of that, and having someone qualified who understands the vibrations in the system, that led to this catastrophic event. Okay, so pressure to, pressure to keep operating, this is always going to occur in your, in your life. Right? Your managers are always pushing you to keep operating. We know that is a, is a reality because the moment that you're not producing, you're not earning money, you're not paying salaries. Okay? So no one wants to shut the plant down. If we can keep it running, you want to keep it running. And you'll find any way to try and keep it running. So pressure to keep running despite having a proper understanding of this intermediate piping and that led to the explosion. So that was um, the main cause of the Flixborough accident. Now, that, that is one, one aspect. Let's take a look at another aspect. When it comes to systems and, and unsafe behavior, the first thing that people say is, well, let's put some safety systems in place. So we put in some feedback control loops, we put in some automation to keep the system from entering a region of unsafe operation. Okay, so this is very, very common. In, in, you've learned in your process control course the basic PI loop. So these are automatic loops. The very lowest level of control in any company is the PI loops. Then you have some automatic loops above that. We're going to learn about that in the next class that automatically will t turn off equipment or turn on equipment as, as the case might be to prevent unsafe operations. So here in Chernobyl we have a situation where um, the main engineer running the site wants to do an experiment as they're powering the, the reactor down. So they're, they're turning the reactor down and, and here, so during a routine shutdown, the reactor crew began preparing for the test. They wanted to determine how long the turbines would spin following a loss of main electrical power. So this is a regular planned shutdown. So they figure, well, let's try and learn something as well from this. This kind of sounds great. We can, we can do this experiment while we're shutting down. So what happens if, how long will our turbines spin following a loss of, of power supply? Now, similar tests have already been carried out at other plants prior. And they know that these reactors are extremely unstable at low power settings. So we've got this potential instability and we have safety systems in place. Now, because you're moving to this unstable system, what happens is the operator were told to disconnect those automatic safety systems. So to do this experiment, we have to disconnect the safety systems because we want to operate the unit in a region that's inherently unstable. Okay, so the safety systems are there to prevent that sort of operation. So to do this experiment, turn off the automation. Okay, so that's uh, it's clear then that what happens, uh, there's the problems occur for the food important diminished uh, operator move to shut down the reactor from the unstable condition. Fuel elements ruptured, the resulting explosive force lifted off the cover plate of the reactor, releasing these products into the atmosphere. Now, we'll see then with the next case study at Three Mile Island, what we learned from this particular incident is we need some sort of containment vessel around our nuclear reactor. So the bit, when you drive past to the Bruce, uh, uh, Bruce Peninsula uh, nuclear reactors, you'll just see a big concrete structure on the outside. That's, that's all you see from the highway, right? Now, those are containment vessels, so everything happens inside it. This uh, Chernobyl unit did not have a large containment vessel. So when this reactor ruptured, 
the color plate in the reactor ruptures, it released the product into the atmosphere rather than into a containment vessel. And so uh, killed a number of people, radiation exposure, and uh, for many years people downstream didn't uh, eat the crops growing on that land and, and so forth. So, so those are the, we, we can read up about the, the fallout from that. But what was interesting there is from our aspect, the common themes that we start to see uh, firstly is let's take shortcuts on the process and then disconnecting automation that's intended to prevent unsafe operation. So, so there's, there's a problem right there with doing that. Let's take a look at another type of problem that occurs. And this is where exactly, this, is, this case study could have almost been um, predicted by the BP case study that we looked at on Monday. So here's a situation with the company taking shortcuts. Killed 3,500 people. This is the biggest accident we've experienced as the chemical. <coughs> now 3,500 is an abstract number. How many people is 3,500? It's the total number of first year students that came to MAC this year. So if we just killed them all, that's pretty much the amount here, right? It's a huge, huge amount of people. It's the largest accident we've ever uh, been responsible for as engineers. And this is, you see here, so many shortcuts were taken. So what happened is that this is the site that I was referring to that has this methyl isocyanate intermediate. So we've got this intermediate chemical compound. Bayer, the competitor to uh, Union Carbide. So Union Carbide is the parent company in the United States. They built this plant in India. Bayer is a German company that creates the same pesticide. They go and pick a flow sheet that does not have this toxic intermediate. So Union Carbide now sits with this problem. They've got this large toxic intermediate and the demand for this chemical product has fallen off, and they've got it stockpiled in large containers underground. Okay. Now, they also had a number of other issues at the site. The materials of construction selected for Opel, instead of using stainless steel, they just used carbon steel, which corroded in the presence of acid, and releases iron, Fe ions, into the water lines. And the Fe ions are a contaminant that accelerates the reaction of methyl isocyanate with water. So methyl isocyanate is known to react with water. So you've got this toxic intermediate. When it reacts with water, it releases a, a, a vapor cloud, explosion due to high pressure. It's an exothermic reaction. So the last thing you want is water in your methyl, methyl isocyanate tanks. That's, that's understandable. The parents actually <coughs> knew about this. So this occurred in 1984. In 1979, the Indian government warned Union Carbide about this problem. And in 1981, a review by, uh, by Union Carbide's parent company, uh, by Propel, the, the site in India, their parent company in the United States, they sent engineers over and said, water is not to go near the methyl isocyanate in my sea. So the first thing you do is, well, let's isolate all the water valves from it. So you put a blind plate, just a horizontal plate in the, in the line so that there's no potential for water to, to come in. Okay, so, so you isolate this tank as much as possible. But during routine maintenance, those plates were removed and never replaced. Okay, so there's now the potential for water to come in. And then this occurs. This explosion, this runaway reaction occurs. So what we have as engineers in our safety analysis of this, we say, well, should this occur, we want to prevent it from going much further. What are the ways we can prevent this explosion from releasing its toxic material into the environment around us? What are some of the ways we might, might, might do or implement? So a toxic vapor cloud could be released, we know this ahead of time, onto our neighbors, onto ourselves. What can we do to prevent that toxic cloud from traveling further and killing people? What are some of the ways you would come up with? <coughs> Talk about it maybe with the person next to you. Maybe like this.
Yeah, like a vacuum system. Well, I don't know if I'll You can always put like a big bubble over it. Yeah. Actually, it would work. It would be ridiculous. That would kill everybody in the society. Okay, so these engineers have come up with four safety systems to prevent it. So what are some of the things they might have come up with? They get another containment vessel. Another containment vessel to contain the, the internal vessel. Okay. Something else. An exhaust. And what are you going to do with this toxic substance that you're exhausting? React it away. Potentially, other options that you could do with this toxic vapor? Sorry? Flare it off. Flare it, burn it. So convert it over to neutral carbon dioxide and water vapor. Anything else? Uh, you could cool it down, operate at a low temperature so you reduce the vapors in the air. Cool the vapors down? And, and the whole operating uh, uh, process. Okay, so these storage tanks keep them at a low temperature. Because it's an exothermic reaction. It's a potential. Uh, so if you if you keep it at a lower react at a lower temperature, it may not react as fast. So you're giving you a bit more time, perhaps. Is that where you're hitting? Yeah. Okay. So those are exactly some of the things that they implemented. Yeah. Let's take a look. They had a coolant loop in this refrigeration tank, which should have been kept at four degrees. They kept it at twenty degrees to save money. Okay, so this refrigeration loop was turned up to 20 degrees to save money. When you're venting this gas, you send it through a scrubber. So a, a, just a, a, vape, a liquid phase that will contact that gas, and you put sodium hydroxide into that scrubber to pull out the MIC, this, this toxic compound. But there was no sodium hydroxide in the scrubber, again, to save costs. They didn't actually keep their safety system up and running. The pipe leading to the flare tower had been dismantled for repairs, so they didn't have an operational flare. So we know that we want to flare our stuff, burn it, but our flare is not working. Because our maintenance is got that disassembled. The water sprays then the final step, and this is a, like such a last, last resort, is if we've got the stuff already pumping out into the atmosphere, if we spray water jets into that, we, that water will contact that toxic chemical and, and rain it down and pull it out of the air to minimize exposure to people. So it's such a last, last resort type of mechanism that's in place. But even there, the water sprays didn't have any sufficient pressure to reach the heights of where the gases were venting out to. Okay, so four systems in place, none of them worked. All of them were down either due to cost savings or because they were under maintenance. So if you read this, this uh, there's, there's a little bit more detail on, on some of the articles that you can look up this, look up this study on. Um, so here's one over here that talks about it. You just you like look at this and you're like, my goodness, this company is taking every single shortcut possible to, um, to save money. And then they killed 3,500 people. They, they tr the government of India tried to file a lawsuit against them that nothing ever really came of it. They tried to extradite the CEO. Again, the US government didn't, didn't cooperate. So kill these people and nothing, nothing to show for it. Like no, no compensation at all. Um, and no, no real ownership of the problem by the parent company. So shortcuts, we've seen shortcuts taking uh, safety systems out of, out of commission and trying to save costs on critical safety equipment as three, three points so far. Let's take a look now at this accident. Um, this is a pharmaceutical facility. So many of you are thinking, well, I'm not working in, I don't want to work in petrochemical, right? So it's, and I'm not going to work in nuclear. So let me find something safe, like pharmaceutical or food. But they don't kill a lot of people. Well, there's an issue in those plants is that you're dealing with dust. So food sites that I've worked in, one of the biggest fears of dust explosions. 
um, any grain that you're dealing with, there's very fine grain dust flying around that settles out, and those dusts are, are explosive. So if, if, the interesting thing about dust explosions is they always, or generally I should say, occur in twos, and it's the second one that's the biggest one. Why is that? But dust lying around that explodes and then there's a second explosion following that that's the bigger one. So that first explosion is from a my, from some localized amount of dust that's exploding. That first explosion triggers shock waves that raises all the other dust that settled all over the company. Um, raises that all dust up into the air and you get your second much, much larger explosion. So that's a common common theme with dust explosions and it just comes down to poor housekeeping and maintenance of your facility. So not keeping the place clean um, is, is critical. Let's take a, a look at this one. Um, we've got, and we'll learn next classes, we've got all these, these layers that we implement. So we've got our safety systems in place and then we've learned from these nuclear accidents that we should try to have some sort of way to contain our accidents. So a concrete building over our, our reactor or some mechanism to contain. And if we really cannot contain, then our reliance is on firefighters, police, ambulances, hospital workers to come and deal with the fallout, right? to minimize the fallout. So that's our final layer of our protection, is these essential services. Now, this was an interesting case study in Switzerland. So in the 70s, they released um, a dioxin, widely believed to be one of the most toxic man-made chemicals in the atmosphere. So police, firefighters, and so on show up at the site to deal with this, and they had no idea that this was the chemical that they were dealing with. In fact, the local authorities and, the, and their neighbors around them had no idea that this was what was going on right next door to them. So what we learned from this accident, and you will definitely see this in your career when you're working with developing new flow sheets, is one of your first steps is you need the municipality's approval. So I worked in, in a company where we had to get the city of Mississauga's approval first before we go ahead and do any work. Before you, you lay down any new construction, they first come in and they look at your plans and they understand every single chemical you're dealing with Every fire department and hospital around you needs to be informed of what species you're, you're working with over there. So that in this very final layer of emergency, um, that they come in with the correct uh, hazmat suits as needed. Okay, so they want to know what they're doing. You don't want to arrive and then realize that you're facing a situation that you have no idea how to work with. Okay, so, so that's, a, that's an important thing that we learned from, uh, from this incident. Oh, sorry, I said Switzerland. It's, it's actually, it's up there too. OK, so let's take a look at, at this one last disaster. And this is one which could easily happen to us. We're going to see this coming up. If you, if you read the, the, the details of the, this accident as it occurred. So this accident occurred in 120 minutes. It seems long time, right? So we've got two hours to figure out what's going on and fix it up. But put yourself in the operator's position and let's take a look at what the operators see. So a nuclear reactor has this, uh, this containment building and there's our nuclear core inside there. There's a steam generator I'll talk about in a minute. We, we generate our electricity over here in this secondary building. The operators are outside all of this. They don't see this. They're in a control room that looks like something you see in, in TV shows. So it's like a mission control, complex, lots of lights, dials, screens, and so forth. Okay. So all we've done these days is we've changed this and made this all electronic and, and digital. So what's happening here, you're, you're halfway through your shift. This is the operator's perspective. If you're sitting there and this alarm is informing you that your cooling pumps have shut down. Okay, now that's not a good thing. Your cooling pumps are there to, to go to the reactor, take the heat away, and that's what you use to generate your electricity from. Okay, but you're not worried because you have backup pumps. Okay, and this happens occasionally. So the backup pumps are indicated on your dials that they've turned on. Backup pumps come on. 
you also see a safety valve open and then the safety valve closed. So this is to relieve excess pressure in the system. So you've got excess pressure buildup in that reactor. You see the valve open, you see it close. It's again, it's, a, it's something that happens from time to time. So again, you're not too worried. You look at your dials and you see the cooling water on that reactor is at the right level. So here's your, cool, your reactor. Um, the water in here is at the right level. So you're, you're happy, right? So this, uh, there's, a, there's a relief valve on the pressurizer that opened and closed momentarily. Here's your pump. The backup pumps are on and pumping, and your water level is right. Okay, so you go back and keep going with the, your regular activities. Drink your cup of coffee and keep monitoring. But what if any one or all of those instruments were lying to you? Okay, so you're sitting there, you're convinced that everything is operating as needed. But the sequence of events that unfolded was such that the person sitting in this room, away from all of this, believes that that process we just described is occurring, but in fact, the instruments are not telling the truth, and mechanically what's happening is not what the instruments are telling you. So let's take a look at, at a nuclear reactor. So we've got our, our nuclear reaction occurring, releasing heat, and we use that heat to heat up this water. So this water is kept in its own loop because there's radiation in it. We don't want to contaminate it with it. So we have a secondary loop of water that runs around here. The secondary loop of water is sent in cold. We heat up that water, create steam. We use that to drive a turbine. So the steam comes into the turbine. We, we spin that around. We've got a condenser. We like to have condensers after that because now we're taking a vapor phase, which occupies a large volume, condense it down to liquid, create a small volume, that drives a vacuum that pulls more steam through. So we get some additional efficiency from it. So we like this, uh, and we've got a secondary loop here so that this water is never in contact with that water. Okay. And we've got a tertiary loop of water that goes out to the cooling towers as well, just to remove some, some excess heat. So that's the, the general principle behind a nuclear reactor. So, what, so here's what occurred. The coolant pump stop, primary coolant pump stop, so within eight seconds, the turbine here stops as well. That's, that's instrumented automatically. So this guy stops. You're not, putting, you're not running your water around here anymore. Because there's no water running around here anymore, you turn your turbine off. And you drop your reactor rods so that they don't generate any more heat. <coughs> so no more heat's being generated. Well, the nuclear reaction stops. But there's still residual heat being generated. It's not an instantaneous off. So residual heat is being generated. The primary coolant pumps have stopped. This heat is going to cause the pressure to rise inside. So still heat, even though that reactor rods are down, no new, no new water coming in to take that heat away, you're going to start generating steam. The pressure inside that reactor increases. So pressure uh, starting to go up. Now your backup pumps come on. So you, you're comfortable with this because it's a regular curse. Only problem is, downstream of the backup pumps, the valves are all closed. So that pump is spinning, but nothing's moving. The valves are closed because all three backup pumps were down for maintenance at the time. The protocol in the nuclear reactor industry is that if your backup systems are down for maintenance, you shut down the entire reactor. You don't run at all. But they didn't. So that was the primary failure in this site was they were not following standard procedure. So backup pumps are not running, despite the fact that you in the control room see the lights showing backup pumps are on, but the valve downstream is closed, that backup pump is not pushing new water in. So it's still the same problem, no new water coming into the reactor. Okay, so <clears throat> you're building up pressure, the safety valve opens over there. Safety valve here is called a pilot operated relief valve, PORV. The pilot operated part is that there's a solenoid on the valve. The solenoid is just a magnetic coil that, that, that indicates the valve's uh, position and will help open the valve. But the instrumentation is on the solenoid. The instrumentation is not on the valve itself. So the solenoid, the electrical components on the valve, 
it, it drops off. It shows that the valve is closed, but mechanically what had occurred is that that valve got mechanically stuck open. So the, again, instrumentation is telling you the valve is closed, mechanically the valve is open. So now you're releasing pressure, and that overflows into this pressurized release tank. So you, you sit in, in the control room, you think that that valve is closed, you think that there's cooling water being fed to this reactor, none of which are true. Okay. So major issues here, no backup pumps because the valves were closed and your instruments are lying to you. What next happens is you're releasing pressure here. So this water that's boiling into the residual heat starts to go into what's called nucleated boiling. So we create these bubbles of steam that collapse, steam collapse, and it's bubbling up, keeping this really just in a steam phase. We've got this pressurizer over here. This pressurizer is filled with water that's gravity drained down into here. So as long as this is filled with water, we think that this reactor is filled with water. Okay, but what's really happening is that all the steam is bubbling up and preventing this water from flowing down into the reactor to come cool. So this is gravity drain. We like gravity because gravity can never be turned off by an operator. So this is a good safety feature. It's an interesting, clever design to use gravity in our favor, except the only problem is that that pipe over there, we cannot drop the water down because the steam pressure is counteracting it. Next problem is we have no level control and no level instrumentation on the reactor. We don't know what the level of the liquid is in here. Our only level indicators are on that pressurizer. And the normal way of operation is as long as the level on that pressurizer says that there's water, we believe that everything below it, so gravity again, anything below that point must also be covered in water. So operators look at that instrument over there and says, there's liquid in my reactor. There's no liquid in their reactor. There's only steam here. We're not sending any new water in. And whatever water is being converted to steam over here is just being vented out here in the pressurized tank. So we've got three things working totally against us over here. No new water coming in. And whatever remaining water we have, we're just converting to steam and venting it. And we're sitting there believing all our instruments around us. The next steps over the next few minutes are, are, are obvious. There's a meltdown. There's loss of, of, of this uh, integrity on this unit. It leaks and releases hydrogen, but none of this explodes. Everything is retained inside here. So that mechanism worked in this case. The containment vessel building worked in the situation. There was no release of radiation to the environment. We didn't kill anyone on this. But as a result of this accident, the public lost trust in nuclear. Okay, so since that state, no new, no new nuclear has been built in the United States. But this is a sequence of events. Mechanical problems on the valve and indicators on our, uh, sense, on our instruments and sensors that are not telling us the truth. So we're going to see these as common themes coming up in the next few classes. Um, so hopefully that's given you some interesting background. I would encourage you to just read, read up some of these articles to fill in a bit more of the details of the sequence of the